Hello there, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, hopefully, you can see me. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking to you today about all kinds of wonderful things. Let me know that you're here in the comments. I think I can hopefully see them. But uh, welcome to Find My Past Fridays Live once again, where we are going to be talking about all of the cool new releases that Find My Past has this week. And then we're going to talk about some other great things too. So I see Andrew saying hi. So it looks like everything's working. That's fantastic. That's helping. Uh, I can see some of you already tuned in. Great stuff. Hi, Linda. Uh, so, uh, yes, what a wonderful Friday it is. End of the week is always an exciting day, particularly because that's when records get released and it's always great to talk about new things. Although there's such a huge collection already and what matters is the record with your ancestors in. So we're really excited today with our question of the week to talk about the things you found over the past few months. It's been quite a strange time, hasn't it? And in that strange time, hopefully you've had some time to have a bit of family history research and uh, maybe you found some exciting new things and you'd like to share with us. So that's really good if you have. Uh, if not, maybe there's something here that might inspire you. So that's quite good, too. Uh, I've definitely found some cool things and uh, I might share some of that. But uh, yes, definitely want to hear your stories, too. I know there have been some that have already been shared. Uh, hi, Karen. Hi, William. Hi, Rosie. Uh, hi, Ali. Um, hi, Patricia. It's great to see all these people saying hello. Uh, Rita is in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. That's great. Uh, I have some family not so far away in Elmwood Park. Uh, so, you know, I know New Jersey pretty well. Uh, good morning from Colorado, North Wales, Australia, Florida. It's fantastic. Hi, Maureen. Hi, in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, hi, Anya. Um, and uh, Massachusetts. It's great. People from all over the world come in here, don't they? Which is uh, wonderful. We can all come together over one thing. So that's uh, uh, why family history has such a unifying, exciting power. So uh, that's why family history is so great. But we have a whole hour to talk about all kinds of great uh, family history stuff. Uh, I'm going to move my microphone. Tell me if I get any quieter or if it's terrible. But now I can see comments a little bit easier. Um, so, uh, We've released some great records this week, a uh, wonderful collection of uh, records from the United States and Britain. We have a few newspapers from Britain. We have uh, some new newspapers completely. The Runcorn Weekly News covering 1913 to 1933 and 1936 to 1970. These newspapers are wonderful again fantastic if your ancestors are from here then this might be exactly what you need to get all of the detail you need later newspapers like these ones are uh, full of photographs those photographs uh, of course are great for our family tree and uh, they're really not unique they're very very common at this point so uh, definitely look and take a look but also these papers just because they may be you know a certain area like here we have runcorn uh, don't discount them because we add all these new papers every single week and every single day and a lot of these stories have been syndicated you might find things from a little further away you might find things from all over the country so definitely check them all and keep looking with those same search terms to see what you get the Clare Freeman and Ennis Gazette as well has been added so that's an Irish paper it covers 1855 to 1884 brand new title again this week for our newspaper collection and we've also added more pages to the Evening Mail from 1869 to 1872, uh, 1874 to 1885, and 1892 to 1922, so a big span of those. And the Cork Daily Herald from 1897 to 1899. In Ireland, especially, newspapers are very good, particularly when we might need them to corroborate which records we're looking at, because we have to think a little bit more laterally when we look at Irish research. Um, we have a few more records as well. I see so many people saying hello in so many different locations as we've seen. Uh, hi, Ricky. You've not tuned in for a while, as you say, and uh, it was great to have you here today. Uh, Alex is in the comments, uh, so he'll be uh, uh, maneuvering and making sure everything is all nice and orderly. Uh, so he's uh, not far away, even though he's not in front of the camera. So do say hello to him as well. And uh, yes, our wonderful records. Uh, we also have uh, the Winthrop Fleet Passenger List, 1630. So that's a little bit later than the Mayflower. Uh, it's a passenger list of people who went to America. About 11 vessels took colonists to America uh, after uh, said the Mayflower, about 10 years later. And of course, many of these people. So this is great for those of you who are in the States or those of you who have American ancestors. But one of the great things that 
I find when we look at earlier records is that these people have so many descendants by now. Um, when we're looking at the 1600s, early 1700s, there could be thousands or tens of thousands of people who are descended from the same person. So when they find that record, there's you know many more people looking for it. And when we look at American records like this passenger list and the other ones that we'll talk about shortly, um, the way that inheritance worked is usually, especially at this point when passage was quite expensive, uh, it meant that um, you had to be middle class or above to really go for the most part. And uh, it was the second sons and the third sons, the ones who weren't in line to inherit all the money tended to be the ones going to make a name for themselves, but with enough money to be able to get across. So if you find and you've managed to get that far back in your uh, British family history and you're finding children and sons particularly, maybe daughters who have disappeared and you don't know where they've gone, Take a look at things like these passenger lists and you might find that you've got a branch of your family in the States that has appeared and there are lots and lots of um, uh, great uh, family history, lineage societies and things like that in the United States that might be able to connect to your uh, part of the tree in the British Isles. So there's another way to look at that. Uh, we've also got emigrant ministers to the Americas have been launched. 1690 to 1811 uh, another place you might find the second or third sons uh, these are people who join the church and then perhaps they move abroad there was a bounty paid for those who wanted to go to the colonies uh, and uh, tend the flock uh, it's a great way to find those Georgians uh, but uh, don't forget this is Church of England so they could also have had wives and children uh, so that means they're not uh, a literal dead end on your family tree there could be another ancestor or they could be again a cousin uncle etc to look for so these things are really useful to take a look at particularly look for your surnames in your family tree and see what you can get we've got another one uh, Swiss emigrants to the American colonies 1734-1744 so it's a smaller set but every single one has names that could be someone's ancestor and of course if you have some Swiss ancestry some uh, heritage there you might find these are perfect for you so that's another great collection uh, it's uh, quite rare this one actually because it was actually created at the departure point so it was created in Switzerland rather than over in the United States when uh, people arrived so that flips things over a little bit and that doesn't happen that often so that makes it quite interesting and that brings our uh, migration month to a wonderful close there's been uh, a lot of records of passenger lists and travel one way and another and things and uh, migration is a part of all of our family story in one way or another whether we are the ones who uh, descend from the migrants or we have relatives who decided to go to Australia or the United States or Canada or South Africa or anywhere else um, these uh, extra records that we have help to uh, tell the rest of the story so they're really really useful it's been really great um, time uh, to uh, bring out some new records and really uh, great themes so I've been really excited by these ones some wonderful other records coming as well in the next few months so keep your eyes peeled and remember every single Friday there are records and they might be your particular record um, taking a look William Shaw said that's what they discovered about a 20th century ancestor uh, their granddad's uncle disappeared and turned up in Ohio yes the 1800s are a period of mass migration to uh, other parts of the world and so you can find plenty of people who disappear uh, perhaps you only have their birth baptism maybe you've got them on a couple of censuses start to look at passenger lists start to find things and of course if you find them on passenger lists particularly in places like the US and Canada then take a look at censuses because those American censuses and Canadian censuses will have where these people were born and uh, when they arrived and that could be the missing part you need to prove that this is your ancestor or not uh, seeing other people uh, Denise saying the Swiss ones are interesting for them they're certainly going to search them that's great hi Anne from British Columbia uh, Karen's question of the week she was given a picture of her two times great grandparents taken in 1925 on the occasion of their golden wedding anniversary that's exciting that's great Oh, getting these pictures are fantastic um, it's uh, sometimes you have to find them you have to really dig in and, and maybe contact a distant relative 
uh, one of the great things that our uh, uh, new messaging system is for. So let us know as well if you've had any great luck from that. Uh, I've sent a few messages and I've had a, a couple of replies, so I'm quite excited. Hi, Cindy. Uh, hi, Julie. She found out her husband's great-grandfather was born 100 yards away from us. It's quite funny how those things repeat, isn't it? It's, it happens more often than you think. It's uh, something that's worth thinking about. Uh, I always uh, find these strange coincidences, and they seem to follow us in our family tree. Um, and uh, you know, it's nice to know that other people have the same ones. It's not just me. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's uh, exciting to see. Uh, let's see what else we've been talking about. Uh, Ella has said, what about the UK people who go to Africa then come back to the UK? Uh, well, there are different lists you can look at. There are passenger lists of people leaving. Depending when you're looking, uh, from 1890 onwards, you can look at passenger lists of leaving the UK. And there are also passenger lists of people coming back. And then there are also all the records you'll find of people at both sides. So there are some um, records, I assume you might mean South Africa if you're talking about British, but there are other different colonies and different areas people may have gone to. Uh, and they will also have different records. Uh, the National Archives has a lot of colonial records that might be of interest. And we've got some records of civil servants if your ancestor worked for the government and went over. I know my great uncle did and was in Nigeria. Uh, and he's in these collections of uh, civil servants that we have on Find My Past. And uh, see, Hillary has found a DNA match this week with someone whose ancestors went to Australia. Uh, I'm I'm very um, impressed at how many people have an Australian connection. I haven't really found too many people who haven't got one yet. Uh, and uh, they come in different sort of times uh, from the very early uh, migrants of the 1700s right the way up to the 1940s and 50s. And even uh, my own cousin went maybe four or five years ago. So, you know, it's going on even today. It's a really sort of big thing. And there are plenty of Australians, especially if you live in London, you might uh, know there's many, many Australians there and uh, in other parts of Britain too. So there's a lot of uh, cross traffic between our two wonderful nations. Uh, Alex has said, uh, oh, very nice. Thank you, uh, Alex. There's worse ways to spend an afternoon than watching Miko talk family history. I can think of many worse ways, and it's usually me talking about other things too. So um, uh, there's definitely um, <laughs> plenty of different ways we can take that comment. Uh, passport applications are great. They are really good tip. Um, passport applications for the US have photographs as well quite often. Um, so if you haven't got a family photo, you can find things. I remember looking at Alexander Graham Bell's photograph on there, you know, the inventor. I think that's on Far My Past. You can take a look and see his face. I think it might be with his wife as well, because they often took family portraits uh, where if both people were traveling away, you'd have the husband and wife stood next to each other on the picture. So that's quite interesting to look at, too. Um, so let's see what else we have. People saying things. Um, happy birthday, Nicole. Um, we're seeing other people wishing you happy birthday as well. It's great uh, that you've, uh, even though you're having a birthday, you're coming in to join us and saying hello. Uh, said, I, I love that we all gather together. Amanda has discovered a passenger list for her great grandfather, Albert Percy Graves, going to Canada. The family thought that he was lying about going there, proves he was telling the truth. It's interesting about family stories. I, I just had a, a chat with uh, the folks at uh, Ellis Island and the New York uh, Genealogical and Biographical Society um, about oral history and about family stories. And it's it's funny how they get passed along and um, they sometimes shift a little bit. They nudge and things and they become more fantastic and more wonderful and strange. And uh, sometimes they're absolutely miles away. But then sometimes you know, they're, they're really, really close to the truth. And we have to find the records then to prove it. And uh, sometimes we might never find the record to prove it. There's lots of stories that we'll never find in records. But then uh, every once in a while, you'll find these stories that really give you exactly the right clues you need to uh, get to these records. So uh, definitely uh, talk to any relatives that you have, uh, even if they're second cousins, third cousins, uh, siblings, uh, uncles, aunts, parents, grandparents, anyone you can find, talk to them, find out what little bits of history, little things they've been given, especially perhaps maybe uh, their parents or grandparents told them something maybe just in passing that they might remember even if it's a hunch it's still really useful because it might nudges in the right direction so that's really good uh, emma has used the merchant seaman records on farmer pass to find a photograph of someone's grandfather they'd never met them or seen a photograph i love those merchant seaman records with the photographs if you've not seen our merchant seaman collection um really big anyone who worked on shipping uh, in the sort of uh, 19th and 20th century 
uh, may be included. But in the mid, early mid 20th century, there's a certain series, a run of I think about 10 to 20 years worth where they all have photographs of each person. And for relatives, I think I've got a third cousin in there because you'd be surprised how many people, especially as we're a, an island nation, have relatives who have been on ships and worked on boats. And uh, those photographs are great. They're little profile, like passport photographs, and they give you more detail about where someone was born, who their next of kin are, the dates of birth, places of birth. Really useful. And, of course, those in the Merchant Navy were being registered in case they were needed for conflict and they were being put into the real Navy. So uh, when we find someone in the Merchant Navy and they're serving about the time that they may have been called up for something like World War One, World War Two, take a look at other naval records as well. You might find them twice. So that's really, really useful. Uh, Anne-Marie McKenzie said, is there a passenger list from Ireland to Scotland? Unfortunately not, because Ireland and Scotland, if you're looking pre uh, 1922 uh, then uh, it's the same place so it's just like moving from say Lincoln to Wolverhampton uh, there's no uh, passport required uh, although some people might say you do need one uh, and uh, you know there's no uh, documents or anything like that no passenger list between things it was just like getting in a car and traveling somewhere so there aren't um, there is one passenger list that I know of uh, which is from the 1600s of people moving from Chester to Northern Ireland to be on the uh, the early uh, plantations and that's in our early passenger list collection on Farm My Past. It's the only place you'll find that. But it's very rare. Uh, assume that there aren't and start looking at other things like census records and things that might help you or perhaps, you know, other if you're looking in Scotland then you've got things like valuation roles and things that might tell you when your ancestors arrived and give you a bit more of a clue about where you're looking and when. Uh, I've seen Anya saying they had great fun helping a friend with her family tree. Uh, her family from Northern Ireland, she was stumped. I found watching Fiona's videos on the Irish Family History Centre right after Farmer Pass Friday have really helped me with my friend's tree as well as my stepdad's, my partner's and my own. Keep your eyes peeled for maybe some interesting uh, Northern Irish records in the near future on Farm My Past. Um, it's uh, one of those places that uh, uh, doesn't get as much love as it deserves, I think, and uh, we're going to rectify that. We're going to put some wonderful collections in there as well. Um, I'm seeing... Uh, um, some great links being posted. Alex is being very, very diligent, very, very quick and speedy. I wonder if we can uh, catch him out, if we can talk about many, many records and see if we can find them all in time. Um, but he's posted a link to those merchant seamen um, with the photographs. So take a look at those uh, and uh, see what you can find and put your surnames in and see what happens. Uh, Christine has said, are there censuses available from Belgium or wedding records? There are. Um, we have some Belgian records, I think, on Farm My Past. I think censuses are in the Belgian state archives. I think they have their own website for that, I believe. Uh, there might be some people, as far as I know, I know we've got some, some Belgian experts that tend to come and visit on a Farm My Past Friday, so they might be able to give you a bit more help there, because that's not really my area. But they do exist, and um, I'm sure that they're, they're able to be found, um, and I think they have been indexed. I'm seeing um, uh, Richard Christmas struggles on their father's side. There's no one living um, and uh, they're interested in the more modern migration. So when we get to modern era, uh, we have the uh, age old dilemma, which is the thing that you can see both sides, but we're genealogists. So we kind of have a, a vested interest in the other side when we're talking about privacy and things like that. Uh, living people's privacy is quite important. And so they have to be protected. But we're genealogists and we want all the information that we can. And, and we know we're, we're not going to use it for nefarious purposes, but we can't guarantee that someone down the road might. So uh, we have to kind of balance it out. Um, in different countries, you'll find different uh, rules. Uh, in Australia, for example, uh, you can find migration records all the way up to the 1970s. And so that is helpful. So we have 1960 for our um, uh, departures. And then after that, it, it kind of changed a little bit also when we talk about migration because of the inventation of uh, uh, flight. And so these passengers came not just on boats, which are a little easier, uh, but many, many planes, which were smaller and had you know more people uh, as on a 
a scale. There were there are many more people as a proportion coming through uh, by plane, and that just increased and increased, and it became harder to keep track of all of these different forms and things. So it starts to fall away as well, um, as well as the privacy rules when we talk about things like arrival sheets. If you've ever been to the United States or Canada or something like that, you have to fill in these little forms to say why you're coming, uh, what you want to do, and you're definitely going to go home and this kind of thing. All of those are stored somewhere, um, but uh, of course they're very private, so uh, you know they won't be coming any anytime soon. Um, and uh, I guess it's up to the government uh, whether they decide to keep them forever or maybe digitize them or they're going to destroy them when they're no longer useful, because that happens as well. When we talk about things that are just comings and goings and that is perceived to have no historical interest, then sometimes the government will just say, well, we don't need this anymore, let's get rid. We've got no space for it. And when you think of how many people come back and forth uh, to and from different countries, especially now in the modern era, it gets a little harder uh, to keep all of it. But there are modern records and there are more modern records. Um, if you're looking at, say, um, the UK, we've got modern electoral registers and electoral rolls, and that's the edited register, so that's not everyone. But um, it's around about half of the population, so you can find modern living relatives. And the United States have also uh, electoral rolls and registers in the same way, so you can also find details of living modern relatives. So you can find those, and there are others around the world as well. I know Australia has a big collection of books like this, and uh, same in Canada. Uh, trade directories and postal directories carry on all the way up to the modern day, so you can use those as well. And uh, if you're looking for a particular area, maybe they might not be online because family history websites tend to be focused on the past. But if you know the name of the kind of directory that's being published, I know in Britain here it's the yellow pages and things like that, then you might be able to reach out to the publisher and have one of those books sent to you. So you might be able to find all the names of all the people in the modern city of say sydney or something like that that might have your surname by getting hold of one of those books so that's another great tip you can do um seeing uh and saying wish there were passenger records for 1963 that was a year we came to canada i'm sure perhaps on the canadian side there might be something although again this privacy thing will make sure that uh, perhaps it might not be so widely available right now but do bear it in mind and do keep looking back to see because sometimes these records have a sort of period where we can look at them and that rolls forward over time. So maybe there's 100 years and 100 years moves forward. So you'll see an extra year added every week or so, uh, every year or something like that as we keep going. See Alex has posted the monoelectoral role. So it's great to see any of these things that we're talking about. You can follow the links and find more about. Um, so uh, a passenger list are now being posted. Uh, lots and lots of extra things to check. Great to give you extra things to look at research. I hope everyone has been doing some of the tips that we've mentioned over these many sessions uh, while we've been in lockdown or isolation or uh, even if we've just been staying in a bit more. Uh, I know uh, I've been rummaging around those auction sites. I found a wonderful ring. Um, it's from the 1760s. It's actually my many times great-grandfather's hair in a, a Georgian mourning ring and uh, I saw it and uh, my heart skipped a beat. It's a beautiful little thing. Uh, unfortunately, it's about £1,800, so it's a bit outside of my price range. But it's great to see these things, and it tells you a bit more of the story. So even if we're not going to reach into our pockets and, and get hold of them, it's still great to see them, and it still helps with our family history. So do keep looking at things like auction sites with your surnames and your names, and uh, then uh, you know you might also find something useful. And I know a couple of people shared some great uh, stories about how they had found some great things on auction sites too. Uh, William has said that the American libraries have been very useful. They've previously done searches for free and sent over newspaper copies via email. Um, and uh, yes, uh, there are so many different libraries and archives out there that at the moment, some of them aren't open yet, some are, uh, so you might have to be a little patient, but of course get your requests ready, plan them out, be very, very specific and clear so that when they get them, uh, they're probably going to be snowed under, there's going to be so many things for them to look at, it might take them some time, but if your request is very, very uh, concise and explains exactly what you want, uh, then uh, I think you know that'll be a breath of fresh air from some of the many, many others that they have to deal with. So um, that will ensure that you'll get something back, hopefully. And um, of course, uh, there are many records that aren't online that are still in archives and libraries that we might need to get a bit further back. 
I see Karen is saying to get saving. Uh, I, I, I don't think I could justify that much money. It's wonderful. His name was uh, uh, James Hunter Blair. He was the uh, provost of Edinburgh um, in the mid 1700s. So um, if you take a look, you could probably find it yourself and take a look at what that ring looks like. And it's just amazing to see his hair as well. I wonder if I could get some DNA from that, but I don't think I probably could. But uh, it's uh, exciting just to see a picture of it. So I'm happy enough. So uh, I don't have to worry. There's no need to, to covet so many things. We don't need them all in life to be happy. As long as we have uh, uh, the details of the ancestors and that that's what matters to me so I'm still quite uh, quite keen with that um, uh, Richard you said uh, where are deaths registered at sea we have a collection of those hopefully Alex will post uh, a uh, link to it but our overseas um, deaths uh, are include deaths at sea as well and uh, so uh, and I would look in there and they carry on. Uh, they are a great index from the register office. Uh, so I would take a look at that and hopefully that will be posted pretty soon. So keep an eye on the comments and I hope hopefully Alex will get to that. And if not, I will come back and I'll post that myself later on. <laughs> on your saying to crowdfund for the ring. That's okay, don't worry. Um, I've, I've got my little picture of it now and I said I'm happy enough. Um, if we all uh, bought all these things, I think we'd send the economy uh, skyrocketing when we're, you know, genealogists wanting bits of their ancestors' lives. We'd never end. We'd have so much stuff. It's nice. As long as someone looks after it, I think that's fine. Uh, I have a, a wonderful uh, story of a, uh, a diary of my great great aunt when she was a student teacher in Glasgow and I found it through um, a BBC uh, website uh, thing they had of a uh, hundred objects to tell the story of the 20th century and she was a teacher right at the turn of the 20th century and learning to be a French teacher in the the, the east end of Glasgow and uh, I reached out to the person who owned it and um, I didn't want to buy it or anything like that but he um, He's looking after it wonderfully, and uh, I, th I think it couldn't wish for a better home. So I'm very happy, and he very um, uh, would uh, just fantastically scanned the whole thing for me. So I had a copy as well. So that was the best possible outcome. So it's always good if you find something like this sometimes to reach out and see what happens, and uh, you never know. So it's great to uh, fill in extra gaps and see how we go. So there we go. So uh, if you can see that. Um, uh, Richard, uh, Alex has just posted the uh, British Nationals Deaths Overseas 1818 to 2005, that's the collection that you want, uh, Patricia collects postcards, found a family and sent photos of them all as they didn't want the postcards, that's great uh, see that's it, it's uh, as genealogists, we, sometimes we don't need the original object and we just want things like the photograph and so uh, there are ways that everyone can be happy and uh, we don't have to worry too much, Amanda's found a listing on Sotheby's auction website from 1999 for four silver candlesticks made by their eight times great grandfather. Dallington Ayres, his apprentice in the 1690s, has their ancestors' hallmark on them, sold for £23,500. That's one of the reasons why, you know, as genealogists, maybe we, we can't ask for all those things because the things we like tend to be quite old and old things tend to be quite expensive. So uh, it can be um, a difficult thing and we could buy so many birth, marriage and death certificates with that money, couldn't we? So uh, maybe we have to uh, decide for ourselves which, uh, which avenue we want to spend our, our pocket money on. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you can be forgiven for not getting hold of those candlesticks. And, uh, uh, yes, it would be good. Alex is right. Maybe you should ask for a family discount. Uh, I did try that with um, a, uh, a, a cousin of mine who uh, makes wonderful shoes. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Lob Shoes, L-O-B-B, -B, uh, a very famous shoemaker in London. Uh, and um, his uh, the original John Lob, the founder of that company, is a... Uh, uh, his uh, mother is my distant aunt, and so uh, I did talk to the uh, uh, the current uh, patriarch of that family and his shoe making company, and they did a wonderful television program about it on uh, BBC, I think, a while ago. I remember sitting there watching it with my grandfather about how they make the shoes and things, and they still do it in the old family way. So it was exciting to see that, and uh, I did I did say, well, maybe I can get some uh, some family discount, uh, but. Uh, uh, they're they're very very expensive shoes because they're made quite well. So my family discount I don't think will uh, will, will mean that I'm walking around in those anytime soon. And Karen's saying that she thinks she owns shares in Scotland's people as she spent so much there. I think you and me both. I think all of us. Uh, so when you find uh, a bit of the family tree, you need to do uh, the great thing about 
Scotland's people, as well as the drawback is that you get those records instantly. So you're very quickly uh, back and looking for more things and you, you can get ahead of yourself and run away with things and find uh, that uh, you might have to put the, the credit card away. Um, has everyone found the uh, PDFs on the GRO website as well for England and Wales? Uh, how much easier it is to order lots of those for different cousins and uncles and aunts uh, as we go further back because it's just so much easier and so much quicker to get hold of. Uh, I've been uh, probably a little too guilty of that rather than waiting for things to go and having them scanned and things. Sue has found lots of documents related to her three times great-great-grandfather. He was a minister in Wick uh, in Scotland. I've been to Wick. It's a very lovely little place. And also on the Synod. I have a picture of him too, thanks to the Keith Ness website. That's great. You can never go wrong with looking for things on Google and things like that. So definitely always look for those surnames and names and see what comes through. Janet's done a really great tip as well. It's always worth contacting the museum near to where your ancestors lived to see if they have old photos. I work in a museum that has many images of prominent local businessmen. Very true. Um, the Canterbury Museum, if you live near there and you go, um, one of my aunts ha donated, I think, a collection of 300 uh, dolls with various different historical and national dress to the Canterbury Museum uh, and I hear that about 20 of them are on display so if you have been there and if you recognize any of those dolls then they're, they're a Clellans so uh, enjoy those and uh, I have to go and see them myself at some point and um, as well as museums don't forget university archives are also full of material and they don't get enough of a, a shout out and a look in but they can be full of different material. We have um, some great records from St Andrews University. We have a Dundee and Angus photo collection, uh, which are great, but they have photographs from all over the UK, Ireland and the world. So there are other places to look and other things. And, and many places I've looked at uh, uh, records of employment in, say, Strathclyde University archive in Glasgow, uh, covering people who worked in shipbuilding and different sort of ironworks and steelworks. Uh, in Warwick, uh, there are records of the uh, trade unions of the 20th century. Some of them are on Farm My Past, some of the bigger trade unions, some that might be really useful to look at. I know that uh, there was a great talk with Ellie and Mike uh, this week about those kinds of records. So look back if you haven't seen that talk, but it's a great place again to look and maybe the particular union you're looking for is still in paper and they might be able to have a look for you. Uh, Sue's made a very good point again. Um, the wills at the moment, £1.50 on um, the government website. We have a fantastic resource, the uh, England and Wales Government Probate Death Index. And so uh, you can search on that government website for names and for people. Uh, it's uh, a very broad search. But on our search, we've indexed in this really clever, special way using a really clever computer uh, to give you first name, last name, places of death, as well as places that they've been registered. And this means that you can really be specific. You can look at exact years, places, names, and find your relative and take that information from the image of that index that we have, just like with your civil birth, marriage, and death records, and then go to that GRO website, go to the uh, will uh, link that uh, Sue has happily put up, the gov.uk. Uh, I think you can Google it for find a will, I think, as well. I'm, I'm not sure the exact link. But then order the will because that will give you all of the probate documents. It will possibly contain the original will. It might give you just the grant of probate or the administration, um, which will again tell you uh, how much money is involved, where it went, etc. And it can give you that extra detail. That was actually, Sue, where I found out about all of these dolls. So um, it's uh, great that you brought that in and uh, brought it all around full circle. Uh, I see Laurie saying, James Joseph Heffernan was a shoemaker, immigrated from Ireland to Chicago, worked for Mullen Bulldog Shoe Company in Chicago in the early 1900s. It's great how these people come over from these different countries and, and they, they work really hard to build these new lives and we can find them in so many records when they do. So uh, it's a wonderful story, uh, Laurie, and uh, it's great that uh, so they'll be in lots of different things like trade directories, censuses and more when you find them, so that can be useful. And saying, try the surname train, it comes up with train schedules. There are lots of people like that with uh, you know uh, people whose surname is Bush or Archer or Smith uh, and it can make things a little more difficult but try a few different things on the newspaper archive you can um, use uh, minuses to remove certain words so you can look for say Bush without the word gardening and things which can help you a lot I think maybe 
I know we talk about this a lot. Um, it might be useful to have a session at some point on how to really search with things like wildcards and um, different phrases you can use and different ways to really interrogate a database because Find My Past is a database and all these family history websites are databases. And some of us are used to archives and libraries where you know we go through page by page through these old records. And then uh, when we get to where we're looking, you know, we take a photo of the image or we down, you know, we get hold of the image and then that's that. But uh, when we use a database, there are other cool technical things you can do that you just can't do on paper. And so it takes a new skill set. So it might be good. Let, let us know if you'd like something like that. And maybe we can have that arranged um, just to really get into the, the, the deep kind of bits of how to um, get the best out of uh, database and website searching because that would be a really good thing to find because it's something that you you really need to look at in a different way and we're in this time where we're split between archives and uh, you know browsing page by page and also databases so there are some people that know just how to use a database who might be the younger ones among us and there are some people who just really are really experienced in archives and libraries and uh, we kind of need to know both if we want to get the best out of things so it's uh, quite important to uh, to really equip yourself with all those skills so I see people saying yes so we'll maybe try and get that arranged pretty soon I see Tracy saying they've got quite good at searching for surname Schweitzer with wildcards. That's a, a good thing. Yes, um, wildcards are great for surnames, especially understanding what name variants do and how to get through those. And they are great. Database savviness. I like that. And I think that's what we should call it. I think the topic should be database savviness. Uh, I'm sure savviness is a word, Christine. So let's definitely have that. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I think now with so many people saying, yes, I've just signed myself up for something <laughs> which um, I, I didn't uh, I, I didn't know it would all come through so so resoundingly uh, i see alex has posted a photograph of his graffiti times great grandfather national portrait gallery site as an mp national portrait gallery is a great website uh, another place where you can find lots of portraits of different people especially if you have ancestors that are uh, a little more illustrious uh, and they have lots um, and uh, it's interesting how you find some pictures and caricatures and things like that outside of things like the illustrious uh those who are say mps etc uh, there's a, a record set that uh, some of the people that we um uh, transcribe with my wonderful volunteers that uh, uh, do some records with uh, all the time we did a wonderful collection of caricatures of people of edinburgh and they they were little hand drawings of these people including you know the ancestor we talked about with the ring and um just describing people like the woman who sold fish at the market with her name and then we have this drawing and the description of her character and things like that and uh, that hopefully will be on farm my past quite soon we've still got that to publish but um you'd be surprised how these things come about these photographs in these different collections you have these photographers that go to these places and don't just take pictures of people who stand and ask for the proper photo that they pay for they might go down to the market and take pictures of people as a sort of life study and things particularly the more creative ones and they will then perhaps list the name of that person so there are other places you can find people and at this sort of point the um you know photo photographs are quite expensive at this early era and so you might find that people can't pay for their own photographs so this might be one of the way to to get hold of your maybe uh, working class or lower middle class ancestors uh, also our criminal uh, registers and records often have photographs and mug shots of those people who've been apprehended uh, so that they can be identified in the future and those photographs might be the only photographs of these people that exist because of that because they probably couldn't afford a photograph of their own so it's a bit of a, an interesting thing that you then might find a photograph because they've been caught doing something they shouldn't have i see james saying they could use some uh tuition as well that's great and uh, yeah we'll definitely get uh, we'll get savvy together on all of that um so uh, i think we'll definitely put that put in um uh patricia's saying whitby photographs are wonderful whitby's a wonderful place in general isn't it and that ruined abbey is fantastic on that cliffside very uh stark and wonderful to see uh and there are lots of other abbeys that are great to look at there's some great ones just outside of leeds i think there's one is it near temple newsom or somewhere like that i'm sure someone who's nearby will will give me a uh, better uh, guidance. I remember going there a few years ago and I really enjoyed it because uh, it's not very well uh, attended and so I was there on my own. It was a, a, a 
interesting thing to wander around to. I think it was free as well, so it was definitely worth looking at. And especially when we have to be distant from everyone, something like that is is worth seeing. There's a, a good one in Fife as well that I think is open uh, to look at. Another ruined abbey, and there are many in the borders of Scotland that if you can get to, you can take a look at. Um, and um, those ruins, uh, after the Reformation, of course, when they're all made into ruins, um, then you know you can uh, really take a look and have a feel for maybe what they might have looked like in their heyday. And they were huge, uh, opulent, magnificent buildings, and um, they do survive. Uh, aside from the you know the big holes in them and the fact they've got no roof, um, you can see some wonderful detail in the masonry and the way they've been made. Uh, you can see old uh, coffins, stone coffins that have been carved out for monks and things. So lots of things you can find in there that are worth looking at. Uh, Anya's just founded a book by their three times great grandfather on eBay. It's in an auction, so yeah, don't share the link. That's one thing to remember that there. I know we're all amongst friends, but yeah, sometimes if you um, let slip that you're related to some person or something like that on these auction websites or something, people might say, "Well, we think you're definitely going to buy it then," and and they might not want to negotiate. They might want to do anything else. So be be um, canny when you're talking about these things. Sometimes just to make sure you don't have that problem. And uh, you know, sometimes there are a few people that are. Um, you know, um, a little more interested in making some money rather than putting these things in their proper home. So, um, you know, there might be someone that might want to buy it and then try and sell it back to you or something. So, yeah, be a little careful when you're sharing the links and things. So I'm fine with mine because I, I don't think I'm ever going to get to mine. So don't worry about my one. But, uh, yes, uh, definitely think about that too. Um, seeing uh, people asking about, I said, Balmerino Abbey. I that might be the one I'm thinking about. I'm not sure. I know Ali from the Five Family History Society is in the comments and she uh, probably has an encyclopedic knowledge of the uh, uh, Fife abbeys that are available to to, to visit. Uh, I just remember looking and planning a trip there myself at some point. So it may be Balmerino that I'm thinking of, but I'll, I'll have to check and get back to you on that one. Um, I see Lloyd mentioning about the pictures of doctors. Uh, I know some of that's answering a question that I saw slip past, but I didn't uh, quite get to read it. You can find info on the licensing if it occurred in Ireland at the RCIS, who has all the apothecary archives. There are lots of colleges of surgeons around the country uh, there's uh, one in London there's Edinburgh and Glasgow and others and they have records of fellows and other records and details of those people who are members they're great places to look I said look forward in the future for something coming uh, from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and uh, take a look also at the records we already have from the Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow, which include uh, Glasgow smallpox inoculations and uh, lists of students, medical students from the Andersonian Institute in Glasgow learning their trade. And remember, when it comes to doctors, they were often members of these um, uh, societies and they didn't practice their doctoring in that city. There were many that did, but there were ones that were in India, London, uh, you know, Wales, uh, Lincolnshire, anywhere you can name, they travelled around, they just were members of these professional societies, professional bodies. So don't be put off when you're seeing that, this, uh, you know, a college of surgeons of a certain location that's nowhere near where you're looking. Look anyway and see what you can find because being a doctor at this sort of point in history was one of those illustrious professions that means that these people tended to be known and they tended to be members of all these different things because you needed some proper qualification. You couldn't just go into it. So that's an important thing. Um, Cindy is saying, apart from checking around relatives who might have been to a wedding, try looking for newspaper reports. You might get a good description, even if not a photo. There are lots of descriptions and photographs of weddings in our newspapers. It's a great place to look for these kind of things. Uh, if you find the details of a wedding, you find a wedding date, perhaps you found a parish record or you found a civil register uh, and you found that detail, look not just on the day of the wedding, look all the way up to maybe about a month or so afterwards because you might not know when these things are reported particularly when it comes to photographs and things it takes a little bit of time to develop them so you won't find it on the same day you might find it the week after or something or at least a few days afterwards when you see those wedding reports and you might even find sometimes a small note of a wedding or an acknowledgement like you have a funeral notice or a death notice and then a few days later or maybe even a week later you'll find the full report where they've investigated and written a full obituary or a full marriage report so there's that to check so don't just see one and go away there might be more so do keep looking uh, Rebecca has mentioned that there are earlier wills at the National Archives. There are many. Uh, before 1858, uh, so I think it's yes, 1858 your link goes to, um, 
uh, and uh, 1858 they are administered by the church and not the government so that's why uh, when it gets to 1858 the website we've looked at just earlier it was one pound fifty each and our index from 1858 that's when they're all centralized and the government had their copy before then the church administered it and it was a, a much more complicated system that we might have to again look into in detail at some other point and uh, we have lots of those online uh, it will depend some are you know local copies some of the central copy the national archives copies are some other copies of different things and they can be all over the place and it's a really really uh, i want to say higgledy piggledy kind of system um takes a lot to get your head around but we have some from devon we have some from cheshire we have many different kinds many different counties going right the way back to the very early centuries uh, and wills of course are full of detail very, very rich documents uh, so worth looking for and looking at the indexes sometimes if you find a will index like we have some many early will indexes on file my past and maybe not the original will then you might go to the local archive and find that original will as well so that's really useful in Ireland for example some of these wills no longer survive at all so you might find the index in one of our genealogical collections uh, where it's been indexed by a researcher before it no longer survived and that might be the only copy I uh, know uh, that uh, in the Civil War when they were guarding the uh, four courts and things and a lot of these uh, documents were destroyed they used some of these very early documents as sandbags and as kind of defenses so some of them have bullet holes and scorch marks and things in and of course many of them just didn't survive at all so you know there are different reasons for it but uh, yeah that might be why your ancestors will doesn't survive um, I'm seeing uh, Janet's watching on eBay as two ancestors were used on models in two watercolor paintings by a local artist yes I think everyone has a um one of those uh white whale kind of things like moby dick where there's a an object they know exists and they're just waiting for it to appear on some auction site or something i know my great great grandfather was given a, a, a stopwatch a little sort of hand watch um uh, in honor of him building part of the school in del Rye in ayrshire um and the school gave it to him in thanks when he retired and um, I, um, I I do wish maybe that would appear at some point on some auction website. But uh, again, hopefully it's got a good home and it's somewhere, so that's okay. But I would like to see it. It's one of those things. Um, Balmerino Abbey is on the Fife side bank of the River Tay. It has a 400-year-old Spanish chestnut tree in the grounds of what was a Cistercian monastery. Uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, visited in the 16th century. Lots of history and a beautiful place to visit. That's from Ali Murray at the Fife Family History Society. Uh, that might, it sounds like, be the one I'm thinking of. So uh, it's great that uh, the two of you can keep me honest. Um, and uh, I will check up and see if it was that. Uh, but uh, yes, I think as we're still in uh, summer, I don't know, uh, please don't go far or start gathering with too many people just in case. But um, some of these outdoor places to visit are the perfect places to go and visit uh, where we don't have to worry too much about uh, anything and we can very easily socially distance when we're looking at places the size of a football field or something so uh, you know if we're going to do anything historic old graveyards uh, old abbeys monasteries old castles and things are probably the best place to be uh, so as genealogists we're kind of in the safest hobby at this kind of time although definitely do please keep as safe as you can while we're going through all of this um, I'm seeing uh, so many different comments, so many wonderful things. I know you have 10 minutes left to talk about all kinds of great things. Um, Victoria Whittle has links to Barbara Flocker at the National Portrait and Oyster Woman. So that's another case, again, a set of not just being the great and the good in these photographs and these portraits. So do look anyway. Take a look at these things and just see. Uh, um, it never hurts. <clears throat> it doesn't take long. Always check. The only thing, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a zero. And that's fine. You know, if we're genealogists, we're used to getting zero results. And so, uh, you know, there's nothing to go wrong there. So uh, all of these ideas, all these resources, all these places, keep looking, keep checking all the time. It's the best thing. And Patricia's saying they love an old graveyard. So do I. They're fantastic, especially some of the older stones. Uh, Dundee has a... Uh, uh, you know the fantastic one called the Half, uh, which is just opposite our office, and um, that's got lots of stones from the 1500s and things, and and that's uh, quite majestic to take a look at. It's a very interesting place to take a walk through. Very small, but uh, very uh, tightly packed and condensed, and so that's very interesting as well. It's quite um, worth bearing in mind as well. Some of these older ones, the Victorians quite liked uh, the idea of the garden cemetery. A cemetery that um, became a kind of attraction of its own a place that you could wander around and enjoy 
uh, in a different way than our other ancestors might have thought of these things. So they try to neaten things up and prepare them in that kind of way. So you know of the the magnificent uh, graveyards in London, at Abney Park and uh, uh, Highgate and all these sort of things. So the, the perfect example is kind of thing. But often sometimes they moved the stones to make them more neat. So if you're looking at very, very old graveyards, like, for example, this Half Cemetery, um, you might not be standing next to your ancestor. Your ancestor might just be in the area. Um, I've got an ancestor buried in the in Westminster Abbey, but not indoors, outdoors in the garden. Um, and that used to be a cemetery. That garden, if you've been to Westminster Abbey, that you know everyone stands and sits on, it used to be the churchyard. And they removed all the stones at some point, and all those stones are in storage. I wish they would uh, perhaps take pictures of them, keep them somewhere. But um, yeah, he's somewhere in there, but who knows where? Now the stones are gone, we don't know. So you know you have to kind of take this in a, a more um, holistic way and say well at least you're around your ancestor but you're uh, you might not be standing right in front of them and uh, uh, Anya's saying that they have uh, a relative buried in the house and keep your eyes peeled in the next month I want to say for something very exciting relating to graveyards particularly in Scotland that may get your attention I want to say no more than that but I think we've got something very big coming that's going to really excite you uh, and great to see so many pe other people love a graveyard and Karen's made a very good point that uh, as long as you're above ground the graveyards are great below ground might be a little less less good um, I know of uh, a house for sale someone sent to me which uh, has its own graveyard and uh, I don't know if that has any implications. I think for a genealogist, again, it's it's a bit of a dream. Um, but, uh, you know, we'd start researching these people, finding their families and things. But it, it was an old converted church and it came with the graveyard. So I guess you can't really move the stones or do anything. I think that's your garden. Uh, but uh, it had uh, a good set of maybe 20 or 30 stones that were there. So uh, I guess we'd be the best people to take care of it. So uh, that would be quite good. But, uh, yeah, that was interesting. It was great to see. Um, sees people looking for the Isle of Man records. The Isle of Man, remember, is a, a crown dependency, I believe, and so it's not quite part of England. Uh, there was a big uh, hoo-ha in the 1700s about making it part of England. It almost became part of Cumberland, and it was down to one man who decided that it definitely wasn't going to be. He fought tooth and nail to make sure that that didn't happen, and so he's the one to uh, thank or curse, depending on your uh, mindset, for the Isle of Man being completely separate from England. But they have different records. Many of them are on Find My Past. We've got quite a nice collection, but there are other sites and other places as well you can take a look at for more records. Uh, Rosie's posted a link there to Manx PMD. And then they said there are some other Facebook pages and Facebook groups too. Um, uh, Amanda said a top tip for looking at a, for a photo on Google. Use quotation marks around a name. Very good. Another one of those kind of digital search tips. Uh, quotation marks really good to kind of make sure that you're looking for a phrase, not just words, because it will start to look for those words in anywhere. And that's the same for newspapers as well. Lots of things. Angela's got lots of their information through visiting graveyards. Those stones are full of detail. You find the death record and the burial record. That's interesting, you know, it's got some more detail, but a stone itself might tell you their occupation. It might tell you details of, you know, their birth date and, and their death date. If we're looking before civil birth, uh, civil birth, marriage and death, we don't get a death date when we look at a burial. We get a burial date, and that's really important. When you look at things like baptisms, it's a baptism date, not a birth date. I see that all the time on people's shared trees where they find that date and they add that as the birth. It's not the birth, it's the baptism. So they may have been born any point beforehand and we're not sure when. So it might discount some records where you might get the age slightly wrong if you take that date as the date of birth. And so this will give you lots of information. I remember going on a, uh, a family history business trip uh, with Find My Past to Cornwall. Uh, and we were speaking to the Cornwall Family History Society uh, with myself and my boss. And uh, as we were driving along, I said, quick, we've got to stop. And we stopped in uh, a little town where my ancestors are from uh, called St. Blasey. And in the uh, cemetery there, in the little yard, overlooking the road that we went past, it's the, the stone basically that is the closest to the road on this kind of, it's about a six foot high uh, wall before that you go down and then you've got the road itself uh, were my uh, five times great grandparents with a nice slate stone with a big description of their whole lives and uh, a little poem as well at the bottom which uh, I'd never seen before and got to see so I got my photo taken in front of that stone and I have a somewhere I think I may have shared it before but uh, yeah it's a wonderful thing to find and something that stays with me and that said all the detail you can find is great 
one thing as well when we look at old stones and i think you know again we talk about these different things about uh you know those people who are buried uh, remember that some stones have worn away depending on the material that's been used many were made of sandstone different things like that uh, many were made of wood and you'll find these wooden things particularly if you were poorer um they may well they definitely will not have survived so you'll find a burial record and you may not find a monumental inscription it will depend and it also depends you know places like scotland for example use sandstone a lot because it's easier to get hold of uh, places like cornwall the west country will often use things like slate it depends on the local stones quite often or perhaps the style of the time you'll find things you know there are many more marble uh, stones when people got a bit more interested in that italian fever that came about in the georgian time people loved things that were italian they loved all things italian and they started to do things in italian styles uh, and so yes we're seeing lots of people talking about their great um uh, details of said uh, people who are buried in scottish cemeteries i say keep your eyes peeled again i'm not saying anything um uh, ali had friends who house the lodge in an edinburgh cemetery they had to keep the door locked after they found a family congregating in their sitting room waiting for funeral to start oh dear <laughs> my my um uh, lloyd has a very famous baptism they found uh, which was late a third step cousin they often can be uh, they can be anything i found them you know up to 10 or 12 years later and andrew's made a good point andrew davis has said methodist records include birth date with a baptism date you sometimes find it on other uh, faiths as well but methodist ones particularly have a lot of detail and of course when we talk about baptisms remember as well when we look at these uh, other faiths sometimes you may be baptized more than once as you uh, change religion so you might find say a methodist baptism and that might be their second baptism they may be 12 or 15 or something and that uh, may be a, a logical reason why they include this birth date because of so many people who have already been baptized so you can understand which ones are adults and which ones are children but that's me speculating i don't know if that's true uh coastal stones are harder to read lloyd says and that's very true they are because of that uh wonderful sea air that we uh like so much it also uh can do some damage too so you know be careful and then of course sometimes you'll find uh cliffside things uh, erode over time and that's dangerous there's a, a castle i really like it's in angus and it's a little away from me here in dundee and it's it's called the red castle it's in a place called lunan uh, and i've been there more times than i can count i really like it it's free and you can just take a walk up there and um, it's right on the top of it they call it a midden in scots and it's a sandstone hill a sand hill like a bank and uh, it's wearing away and it's, it's a sort of 14th century castle and it's wearing away this tower uh, at a rate of knots and so the whole corner of the the main sort of bit of the keep is completely free hanging over the top of the this thing and any day now it's going to fall into the, the the beach and onto the sea and be washed away and so it's one of those things that you can see there's already a crack that started to form and it could go any time so i go out there and take a look and it's a little bit of a shame it's kind of beyond saving but it's uh, great to come and see these things uh graham that's a good question what happens when you pass on what happens to your family tree um it's important as genealogists we talk about preserving the past but preserving the future as well that's a really good comment and a good point um i i've kind of made a little bit of a note some people will add it to their will they might add different things uh, you can have a, a jedcom which is the name of the, the file you can download with your family tree always keep another copy of that somewhere safe um, and make sure that that's available for the people um, some people make their trees public so that everyone can see them anyway uh, but sometimes you know you want to keep yours private it's up to you and you just want to give it to your family when you pass on and things but you can make arrangements i know i've seen people talk about things like a digital will and things where you put your passwords and login details for certain things in a safe secure place that can only be opened when you're no longer with us and things so that might be something to look at uh, i don't know too much about modern uh, will making i don't think i've got one of my own even but uh i think there are a few places that you can look into that kind of stuff and that might be worth doing uh, but definitely good to think about that just in case because you never know when the worst might happen and we don't want all this research to lie somewhere and never be seen again because it can be really important for somewhere and someone uh, to make sure that they can carry on with that story because we're only really the 
uh, custodians. We we keep hold of this family history for a generation and we don't really own it. We just polish it and clean it up and correct it. And then we pass it on to the next person and the next person hopefully will keep going. And the more records that come, maybe in a hundred years when every single record in the world is online, keep my fingers crossed for that, then this will be a lot easier and we might be able to find all kinds of great stories that people standing on our research can then use and can tell that story and they maybe couldn't have done if they didn't have that. So it's a great thing. I see Cindy's talking about London Bay and saying it's fabulous. She's always expecting some of that tower to fall down. It is a fantastic place. And yes, so we're talking about the very same place. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a shame. Uh, I, if you do get a chance and you are nearby, uh, take a look at that before it does go. Um, it's been ready to go any day now for, for a few years, but uh, yeah who knows when and you don't know what's gonna happen when it's gone so definitely have a look um and uh, i know we're getting right close to the end uh, of the hour i know it's quite easy to lose track when we're talking amongst friends isn't it uh i know we've we've had a great chat about so these different things but take a look at those new records for this week uh particularly if you've got ancestors that migrated and also if you've got your family tree back far enough and you've got some siblings and cousins that you haven't found great take a look at all of the uh family history uh, records that we have online there are so many to look at and you never know what might be useful um aha oh, thank you ricky i see you're saying you're about to finish working in naples would like any souvenirs i might well do actually uh, my family left naples in 1444 uh, according to the records that i have and then moved to sicily so uh, and, and then i've been sicilian ever since so yes i have my family connection a little bit further back i don't think you can take the castle with you uh, because otherwise maybe i'd try that but uh, how, how how wonderful thank you very much ricky um and uh, so it's great to gather with you and it's great that we're all finding great stuff. I really enjoyed hearing your breakthroughs and it's great that you can share them um, with each other and I uh, see everyone conversing with each other. So that's that's great too. It's a wonderful community that we've built. The Fire My Past Forum is a great space to keep doing that and uh, talk about the things you've found because it's not just about asking research questions. It's about showing what you found and maybe some tips, things that you might think are useful and great. So that's a great thing too. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all uh, and uh, I think next Friday I'm sure Alex will be back and we'll be back to regular programming although I guess me dropping in once in a while is definitely regular and uh, then um, I, I say William you asked for a castle stone if everyone took a castle stone there'd be no castle left so we've got to <laughs> got to be careful with that one so uh, we've got to uh, watch out but um, yes it's wonderful to see you all um i hope to see you again i hope to see you on more sessions i know there are more coming next month we'll be talking about great things and um i uh, hope that in this time where perhaps it looks like we may be indoors a lot a little more over the winter uh you can line up some great family history research you've got some really good records i really want to talk about but can't yet that um will be coming uh, over that uh winter and autumn period so uh, keep your eyes peeled make sure you subscribe to the newsletter or keep checking back here to find out what these things are and uh, we're going to um, have some great fun looking through those some great new sessions with all these different experts uh, from in-house and outside and uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you again soon thanks very much and have a great weekend see you later